Hello and welcome to another episode of the 21st Century Work Life Podcast, where we talk about how the world of work and our attitudes to work are changing. And I am delighted today to catch up with a friend. <laughs> this is the, <laughs> the wonderful thing about podcasting and, well... Her LinkedIn profile, because I, I always go to LinkedIn to see how people uh, how how people um, describe themselves. She's a tech storyteller, looking at the culture side of tech journalists. And what I'm doing now is I am inviting guests to say their name so that listeners can actually hear people say their name how they say it. So, would you like to tell us your name, and then we can carry on? Jen Riggins. Thank you very much. It's uh, yeah, very good. You follow the instructions uh, to the letter, which is really unusual as well. <laughs> Great. And you are, amongst other things, a feature writer at The New Stack. But you're a tech journalist, you're a tech storyteller. So what kind of stories do you look for at the moment? The impact of technology is always my area. And it's usually on the impact of technology on the humans creating that technology. So a lot of what I do is about this year, I, well, wait, we're in 2024 now, last uh, and this year, I assumed most of my job was going to be talking about layoffs, which part of it is, and it is important we talk about it, but a couple other things happened that coincide with the layoffs. I'm not saying which came first, chicken or egg, but they're definitely related, which would be a greater focus on developer experience and developer productivity. There's also an onslaught of tools and in within those tools and as a separate topic, but related is this huge push for generative AI. So these are the conversation-based AI that trains on our conversations online, maybe trains internally on your documents within your organization, your policies, and then acts like an interactive Google. Mm -hmm. So I think all of those kind of intertwine because we have teams that have more complex software than ever are dealing with more distributed, complex systems than ever. Often at an older company or a larger company, hundreds of tools linked together. And then you have layoffs, which means teams are tighter or companies are at least on hiring freezes. So they are literally trying to do more with less. But generative AI could or could not be a solution to help ameliorate that. And even if the goal of generative AI should be and the goal of gen developer productivity is or should be getting rid of the mundane, getting rid of the repetitive work and going from this idea that it's, it's almost a slur, this term code monkey, but this idea that developers are button pushers and not creative to the idea that they are creative workers and problem solvers. You mentioned as well, as well as Gen AI, you mentioned other tools. So what other things have crept in that space over the, the, last, the last year, the last 12 months? Well, first came Agile, then came DevOps. Mm -hmm. But DevOps is kind of weird because it's really about operations and a kind of doesn't talk about the first half of the portmanteau. So there was this idea with DevOps for the last 15 years or so that a developer should be able to control the entire software lifecycle from the design to releasing to testing to monitoring their own work. Except when you have a seven layer stack now, that becomes impossible and also is not the differential work. It's platforms have existed forever. Platforms just were something that were used to top down tell people what to do. Platform engineering kind of puts it on its head. And like a platform, it supports developers. So they can see if you're standing on something like scaffolding, you can look below. You can see below, but you don't really need to worry about it. You know that you're building standing, hopefully. 
you want to know what's going on below, but you don't really need to work. You're building upwards if you're a builder. So a friend of mine who works uh, on the open source project Cradix and at the company Sintasso and is one of the main contributors of the platform maturity model, she, Abby Bangzer, defines platform engineering as the non-differential, but not unimportant work. So things that have to be happening, the platform engineering takes care of security, Mm-hmm. deployment, testing. It can be all these different things that are security, very important thing. But then according to the Linux Foundation survey a couple of years ago, only 3% of developers want to be responsible for security. 3%. So that's important, but also that's not their job. Their job is through DevOps. The idea of DevOps is to reduce friction so the development teams can deliver value to the end user or customer faster. So for platform engineering, their customers are the internal developers and they take care of that not unimportant, really important usually, but not differential work. So the developers can still look under and understand what's happening. And if they want to build something, they can. There's this whole golden paths. This comes from Spotify. And I like to call it the yellow brick road, where you can stay on the yellow brick road and you have all of your things supported. You know where you're going. But if you go off, I don't know, into a poppy field, you may take a nap and the platform team is not going to support you. So that's this whole idea of enabling developer productivity because you're getting rid of that repetitive, boring, non-differential work. But some engineers are still going to do their own thing. And that's fine. They just might end up in a poppy field or with flying monkeys or something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love the I love the analogy. <laughs> really, really nice. This is a whole. I mean, I have to be honest. This is a world that I know nothing about, which is one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about because I read through your wonderful article, which I've got here, which is called "Will Generative AI Kill DevSecOps?" And I stopped at kill because I didn't understand DevSecOps. <laughs> and so and so that's why I read through it. I thought, I think I understand this, but this is quite an interesting conversation that actually has lots of parallels with lots of other work as well. But so so let's start let's start there. The um so the title is Will Generative AI Kill DevSecOps? And it's published in the new stack where you're a staff writer on the 15th of February 2024. Uh just to give you the the by, well the, the subheading, uh, Gen AI isn't going to run DevSecOps off, but it certainly is making them run down. How can security teams keep up with this speed of code? So now I understand with the yellow brick road and the platform. They're looking at what's going on under the platform. I can see like if the developers are running away using all kinds of things and the security are trying to keep up, I can see how that's a problem. So th- so tell, tell us about this. Tell us about this piece and uh, why you wrote it. It was part of a conference when you were reporting on a session at the conference at the State of Open Con. So what is the State of Open Con? Well, I hosted a couple panels there too that were very interesting, but the State of OpenCon is something run by Open UK, which is, I believe, non-profit, but is an organization that supports open source in the UK, both the projects in, and I believe the UK actually has the higher per capita amount of accounts on GitHub, which is the closest thing we usually have to demographics in something as distributed as open source. And then also about making sure the external perspectives come in and the UK perspective goes out. So State of OpenCon started about a year ago on a whim. And then seven weeks later, there was a really fantastic event. And this was another fantastic event that just lets different topics around open source be spoken about. Last year's had a huge, heavy theme on platform engineering, and this year had an even heavier theme on AI, because Mm -hmm. that is what's changed. And it's interesting because it's not just changed in the tech world. Like You're writing a book with AI, right? Or (laughs) coinciding with AI right now, Pilar. So 
normies or regular people are using AI as well to hopefully increase their productivity. We're not sure yet. It's a time of ex experimentation, but that is a bit problematic when you're talking about the largest research project probably ever, which mm -hmm. is OpenAI. So anything you're doing in the free versions of the of GitHub Copilot or ChatGPT is going into public rate you're you're the user you are not a customer you're a user you are a patient in their research it's so interesting that you talked about it like the a really big experiment because it's reminding me that i find so many parallels with um, generative ai and remote work and now you're talking about this experiment i'm thinking oh that reminds me of that experiment we had many years ago which we didn't set up <laughs> yeah <laughs> and the difference is that remote work tends to benefit the most marginalized people in society and is the, one of the most inclusive, if done well, actions you can do as a company. But AI maybe isn't. AI may be at scale bias. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let let's let's not go there then. <laughs> let's let's not go there for now because I don't know enough to defend any corner that I would like to defend. Uh, so let's, but but let's take that up. So so tell me what are just going back to um, the world of software. What are developers using Gen AI for? Everything. So there are the tools like ChatGPT and GitHub's Copilot that well let's let's talk specifically like ChatGPT is more of a public facing idea so is bard which i think is just rebranded last week to be called gemini yeah. these are just open chatbots and they're conversations they're both trained on the internet we don't know what else they're trained on they don't often have citation but they're an interesting way to brainstorm have conversations but developers are using ChatGPT, for example, for help with code. And then there's more developer-focused ones. Like, again, I think it got rebranded as part of Gemini, but it, Google had something called Duet AI. The biggest is Copilot, which I think is 10 bucks a month and is within the code base, within the repository. You can have a chat. Mm -hmm. One of the problems that, I mean, has not been dealt with and is an optimistic thing to deal with. I've been in this gig probably 13 years. And the number one thing developers complain about is documentation or lack thereof. But the number one thing developers don't want to take time because they're so busy trying to get faster and faster, releasing, et cetera, to do is contribute to documentation. So this is one of those use cases where soon, if not now, it should be a way to not only create documentation, but to do it in a way that's in with code. Because the main one of the main focuses of platform engineering and this whole developer experience and this idea of making developers more productive is that they're just filled with, and I'm sure any industry understands this, we're just filled with interruptions. We're filled with a Slack pinging us. We're filled with having to ask someone in another department for help with something. We're filled trying to find the answer to something. Meetings. All of these things, and the more complex an organization is, the less agile, the more waterfall, because that still exists, an organization is, the more interruptions. So developers are losing this emphasis on focused work and being able to problem solve. So part of that is just switching tools, figuring out how to release, do things that are not that differential work. So the idea is that AI could be used, especially when integrated within the code base, to help people stay focused and have the answer where it is. Also, you don't need to wait to talk to a human, potentially. You could just have a conversation with the chatbot to find an answer to something. Mm -hmm. So... Is is what you're saying then that because the whether it's ChatGPT or some other version that we use in the future, uh, that we don't need as much documentation because 
everything is potentially there? What Because you, you mentioned about documentation and the fact that there's no time. So what is the... Well, it produced that documentation and it produced okay. it in an interactive conversational way. So how do I do this instead of like having to SEO optimize or optimize it for people to be able to find that answer or often it's not written down anywhere. So there's a tool Mm -hmm. called Jogger, J-O-G-G-R, that I think is very interesting because they're focusing just, just on this use case because docs are something that, again, people just complain about, but then nobody's doing anything about it because it's kind of boring work. To describe, it's not simple work. It's a very complex job role. Technical writers are in deeply high demand and are translating the who, what, why of everything. But also things like when you join a company, figuring out who does what is very time consuming, both for you to get on board and then for whoever's mentoring you or responding to you. Uh, because Spotify put in these, we call guardrails since they started it, they went from to having someone fully onboarded is considered them having done 10 releases or 10 pull requests. Mm -hmm. And then with that, I'm looking up now the answer. I think they went from, yes, they went from 110 days of onboarding to 20. Because they've created this golden pathway. And that's just that. But then add AI on top of that, what can they achieve? So that's the positive. We haven't even talked about all that really scary negative stuff. Yeah, yeah. But th- those, I mean, those are the consequences. I'm just, uh, I-, I-, I just want to understand what it is that coders might be doing. That's the thing, writing their code now. Yeah, they're writing their code with it. Given that then... DevSecOps, which is developer security operations, yep. that right? Given that, you can see how people in charge of security, <laughs> who, like you say, are looking after coders, I can see what's going on. Tell us. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, this is the thing. The core pro, I'm going to actually read from my article because I think I finally put them together, this idea. So, there's a couple problems. The first main problem to me is that companies don't have policies. So we're about a year into this, so people should. And there's that risk that they could put personal sensitive information into the chatbot. There's also a risk that they can put their intellectual property in the chatbot, which is what happened to Samsung last year. When two developers used ChatGPT for very reasonable things, not to write their code, but to check for errors to test it, to see if it's okay, clean it up a bit. That seems like a great use case for generative AI, except that it's not an open source project. It's Samsung. It's their proprietary code that they put in the chatbot. So Samsung was like, oh, we're just going to ban it, which again, then they're not getting the benefit of AI because other companies aren't just going to do a blanket ban. But communicating, don't put private information in there. So... There's also the problem that the last research done on, that I found on ChatGPT was that while it's super persuasive, it was the code was wrong 52% of the time. Which is a large proportion. <laughs> so this idea is that a chatbot is trained to give an answer. It is literally a tech bro trained by tech bros. So that's where it gets all its confidence. And that's where it gets all these biases and problems. So it is trained to give an answer. So if you don't tell your developers to like ask, hey, do you know the answer? Can you can you give me the where you learned that from, where that information came from? They're just accepting it as true and it's not. And then so there's this added layer that a chatbot's response is based on the probability of being accepted. So that doesn't mean it's accurate. It just means yeah. it wants to be right. So it's going to give you the answer you want to hear. My and your seven-year-old does this sometimes. And I can tell when he's bullshitting me, but I can't tell him with a chat bot if they're like, you know, I can't look them in the eyes to tell that. Um, hopefully I still keep that with my kid at least. But it also isn't considering 
at least these public chatbots. I, I believe this will evolve soon, especially on something if you're going all in, all of the cloud providers, Azure, Google are coming up with their own that are based inside your company and with the context your company, hopefully this will improve, but mm -hmm. it's not on the overall fit within the context of your code base. It's not looking to simplify code base, it's just providing code. So more code has been created and released. Again, we usually use GitHub because it's like 85% of the code that's publicly available and stuff. So most things are trained on that. Most studies are in that. And GitHub, well, my, is owned by Microsoft, which also yeah. has GPT and GitHub Copilot. Mm -hmm. So with all that context, more code has been created than ever. So code is being created faster and more. So how is security able to then keep up with code creation when it's created that way. We also have this added thing where the understanding of the people that seem to benefit most from this conversation, like status is the long-term developers, the people that have been doing this for a really long time and they're able to scan code. But what is the concern of new developers, especially those that went to university because or got just graduated with a computer science degree? Because a boot camp can tend to be more practical, but they're taught to just build fresh greenfield, like build new things. But most first jobs, especially, are not building new things. They're working on these complex code bases. And also, like my kids learning to read and write. There will be errors that you correct. And there's like, you practice that. You practice like using this word or this word. I'm sure it exists in other languages too, but English is more complex than most. So you have to work harder for things like that. But they're not doing that. So a very advanced coder, someone with five or more years can just scan code and see what's wrong or not. It can use it for that brainstorming that's like really helpful. And as long as you're not putting secure code in, I would recommend using them, these chatbots for this brainstorming because it kind of helps you, but nothing private or personal in there. But a newcomer is just taking it for granted that that bot is smarter than them. So it's right. There's also this idea. It's, it's nice because you can be very nervous in asking for help especially when you're new at a job or company or new in the industry as a whole. So you can ask this bot for help, but then we're losing that human interaction as well, where we want humans teaching humans still and helping. So all that to say, just sum up, we're making more code. It's not great. It's coming out faster and we can't really test the security of it all. I was talking to my friend Sal Kimmich, and they are this brilliant mind in cybersecurity. And I said, really, I if this time last year, my strongest prediction was that we would have a major, like a major security vulnerability got through because someone trained the chatbots with it. Because how easy would that be? I also thought we were whistleblowing, like that would be a way to get out to journalists, things that you don't want to be able to track that you whistleblowed. But, and I said that to them and I said, I'm actually shocked. And they were like, oh no, there definitely is. We just haven't found it yet. Yeah. They were so confident. They're like, no, there's no way. There's definitely in there that vulnerability. We just haven't found it yet. And when it happens, it's going to be potentially catastrophic to code bases, but we'll see. Yeah. So I'm hearing lots of different things. Um, one is uh, we have, so we, we know that generative AI is great for create, you can ask it to create things if you are quite experienced in the topic. I mean, this is my experience with writing because it's going to, you say, and, and, and I hadn't heard it put this way that it tells you what, basically what's been more he didn't say popular, but what has more approval. That's what what it was. Because I've always said, yeah, okay, it comes, it predicts 
what the most common next bit is, but actually this approval thing, I really, yeah, I think that, that, that makes a lot of sense and that's a different mindset to, to look at it from. So it is generating things that, that meet with more approval, but might not be correct. So the more experience we have in what we are talking to them about or creating, the better because we can assess that. So we can see how that being used by more junior people can, can, be, an, can be an issue. A plus, there is this, um, when we are creating with the bot, we are not learning as much, especially if we're not experienced because we're not going through a cycle of learning. We're not going, we're not testing, we don't understand where things are coming from. And the other thing, finally, I think is what you're saying about, well, a couple of things. One is with all of that, we might have code that is not good. <laughs> That's my, that'll be my word. <laughs> but at the same time, we've got so much of it generated. So how can how do then the security people keep up with that, with just the amount? So we've got the amount and the quality to deal with. And AI may be a solution to help them. If DevSecOps is training the large language models, the LMs, if they're training it, they may be able to then helpfully find it. The panel, this was from Open UK, the panel ended quite optimistically that it's going to be a shit show for now, but it will improve much quicker. And even we've seen that with the versions of ChatGPT, which frankly, 3.5 was a racist hellscape because it was trained on the internet which can be that. And then they hired a bunch of people in Kenya, the most vulnerable, and paid them like a dollar an hour to manually remove the harm that would be most attacking them. But it is improving and it will exponentially improve because it should. It's it's designed to self-improve. And on the other side, what we just said, it's giving you the answer that's most likely to be accepted. So. First of all, society, not the best thing to be. <laughs> the majority may not be the best solution. It may not be the most creative. Are we crushing creativity that way? I don't know. I'm very skeptical of it. I think where it's really useful are really boring things, but fun, like documentation or brainstorming or I know people that use it to plan their gym routine or especially holidays. Evidently, it's supposed to be great for, but should it be something that is integrated in our code base permanently? <laughs> yeah, permanently as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the the other the other part, there's a couple of other things actually that you did you were mentioning in the article, like Another issue with security trying to deal with this is, is it is a lot of it. Some of it is wrong and already has lots of vulnerabilities, so their work is increased. But also, they don't know how the bot came up with it. Yeah, there's no background to that, it, at least with the open AIs. This is an argument that maybe an open source would be better because we can see what's, to use that very manly euphemism, what's under the hood of the car. Um, but I haven't actually used ChatGPT, so I should be honest. I haven't. I don't trust the ethics that went into the creation of it. In the rare instances I have used Bard, or I think it's called Gemini now, the Google one. First of all, my assumption is Google has so much of my data because I use Google Workplace. Mm. Um... I also, as a journalist and marketeer, I kind of assume its responses will be better for SEO, but I use it for nothing under my byline, crap I don't care about, and fractions, which to me is like a big deal because I've never been able to do fractions, so it saved me extraordinary time because I can ask it things around fractions, which seems like a silly thing, but I just, I think we're moving too fast with it. I don't think it's there yet and companies aren't ready for it yet. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm shocked that less than a third of companies have an AI, generative AI policy, governance policy. I think it's something they should be evolving and 
we're just accepting that people are using because guess what? Your your staff is absolutely using it. But if you provide them with no guidelines, it's going to be a problem. Like with Samsung, that this somebody, first of all, somebody bought a Chevy for a dollar because the chatbot said, okay. And now I believe it's Canada Air, but a Canada Airline. Yeah, Air Canada, sorry, is the airline. Must honor a refund policy that its chatbot invented. So we have tons of companies that one of the biggest layoffs outside of certain technical roles and things was customer support because they're like, boom, we're done with that. But companies are now liable for policies that their AI set. And that's pretty nutty. If you think about it, that seems irresponsible that you're not checking into your bots, your training and stuff. There needs to be a human in the loop still. Because if you're saying that the code can be cr that's created cannot be good, if also uh, there's more created than actually people can keep up with, um, yes, you can see how all these, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's lots, lots of problems. It's just spiraling out of control. Because I'm really interested in this um I'd never thought of how it was affecting the people who are not just the developers, uh, but also the people who are in charge of making sure that the developers have everything they need. So you mentioned that maybe we can use um, that. Actually, ironically, we can use some kind of gen AI or other kinds of AI, because let's remember that there's a lot of AI anyway being used in this work anyway. It's not just the, the generative one. They can use some for to automate some of this, but they're still trying to get on top of it. So where, where, where's it going? Where, where are we now, do you think? Well, it's interesting because a patch, which is like a fix, well, mm -hmm. like you imagine a patch on jeans, for an open source project, it takes over a year for people to employ or to actually do. So this vulnerability will be out there known. This is known vulnerabilities. Once a, once a vulnerability has been detected and communicated and a fix made and communicated, it'll still take over a year. So that's because these code bases are so complex. So if you can use AI to detect anomalies, detect behavior difference, like maybe a contributor or an individual contributor on your team is acting differently. Like, because your code is kind of like your handwriting. It should have this unique flavor and be somehow detectable that there's something different. If it can detect the presence of these vulnerabilities that no one bothered protecting and then put a block. Okay. If you don't fix this, mm -hmm. you can't release your code or it eventually will fix it itself. That's very interesting. If it's done securely and I guess internally then, not something externally trained. Um, another thing is just issue summaries so people understand what went wrong, communicating postmortems when things go wrong. And it's nice because it should still contribute to this blameless culture where when things go wrong, you don't want people squirreling away and feeling secretive or to blame or their jobs at risk because things are going to happen. Look what happened with the NHS a few years ago. What was it? Seven years ago when somebody had a pop-up and it brought down the whole NHS got hacked because they were set, they were blackmailed or something like it's not just technical people involved, but no one should be to blame. So then hopefully that creates a blameless culture. If, the AI is detecting it. So that would be good. That's more beginner. It's not there yet, but I predict it would be in the next year or two. Mm -hmm. So it could be a tool to use. But again, it all comes down to what's it trained on and what do we know? Because that could also lead to more vulnerabilities if someone trains a AI security tool to specifically open a tiny little hole that only they know about and they can take advantage of. Yeah. You can see how when, when we bring someone in to work with us, we look at their CV, we see who they've worked with, we ask some people who've worked for them, references, we work mm -hmm. with them a bit, and then <laughs> we give them a trial period. 
However, we're adopting someone who is doing the work that has traditionally been done by a human and really getting in the depths of our organization without having done all that before we've allowed it in. So, yeah. And they don't want to lose it. Developers love this tool. Yeah. The productivity gains are extraordinary. It's just also letting in this other stuff. Like there are, this is where it's indicative of remote work, where people are like, if you make us come back to the office, we're going to quit because a lot of the big tech companies keep trying and failing at bringing return to office because nobody wants to. Who would want to do their laundry on the weekends? Who wants to be in a commute? People want to be able to get focus work, which they can do much more, much better at home. It's similar where people would quit over not having access to like co-pilot. But they, that doesn't mean they know how to use it properly. And they know not to put that sensitive information. It's just crazy to me. Like It's wild to me that less than a third of companies have an AI policy. And it should be specific to each tool. And you should put your AI tools on probation, like we just said, for, I don't know, what is it, six months, three months that people before they're really hired? And then evaluate if people should be using the tool because there will be tools that shouldn't be evaluated. The, the EU's got some really interesting policies and then they categorize the EU AI Act should be really interesting as it's coming down the line. So they are have unacceptable AI high-risk AI, and general-purpose AI. So they even include ChatGPT under the high-risk AI that needs to have this certain level of approval and caution, and you need to provide advice versus general AI that's just like super transparent and you can do it. And then unacceptable AI, they consider like things with facial recognition they want to ban in the EU because they look at that as a threat to humans which is wonderful that somebody is considering it. It shouldn't be that weird and surprising, but um, an agile tool I really recommend that I've been recommending for years is a practice called consequence scanning, which I think we should do with everything, but especially at tech, because we need to think about what if it became suddenly like open AI that people are using it at like a global scale. Millions of users suddenly are using it. So you have to think about with your technology and also with your AI, as you evaluate tools, what are the intended and unintended consequences of this product or feature? What are the positive consequences we want to focus on, like in this situation, developer productivity, giving them more focus time, not having to jump from tool to tool to figure out how things work? And then what are the consequences we want to mitigate? So what can you do to make it safer? Because developers are not getting not going to be okay with getting rid of these tools. They're pair programming with a bot and they're loving it and they're really finding great productivity. But how can you help them do it in a safe way? Yeah, it's uh yeah, security cannot say stop that, ban that, because there's no way. It's just and Samsung did. Samsung did and I would love to know if they've lost staff because of it. But a great thing that Hannah Foxwell had said in the talk, and I didn't know this study until afterwards, super interesting. So we all remember that all made headlines when Italy banned ChatGPT for a couple of weeks. And there was a visible decrease in productivity and people released less code during that. So that's one consequence. But then when it when Italy reapproved ChatGPT, they basically, there was this usage of tools that go around the government policies. There was a huge uptick in creation and sharing because in open source world, like sharing these tools that could get around any ban if Italy did another ban. That's how much people wanted it and how risky it is to ban it. Yeah. And, and that's another place where legislation and people who are not there in the work doing adopting technology do not understand how global the internet has made us and connected <laughs> as well. Yeah. Engineers will always engineer their way around a problem. Yeah, yeah. Great. Is there anything else that you um, that you want to share about uh, this talk, this topic, or or even this conference? You shared. You said you you chaired a couple of other panels. 
All the talks are online now, so you can find it on the Open UK YouTube. Uh, it's a very interesting conversation because it was an emerging theme, as the overarching theme seemed to be AI. One of the emerging themes was how to get people paid to create open source. So I think that's a very interesting area because so many companies are benefiting. The behemoths, what you know is big tech, are benefiting off of a lot of times unpaid labor, which then becomes a security issue. They, I think it's 46% of maintainers of open source are unpaid and then another 20-something percent get 1000 a month, which in tech is well below the poverty line in tech. And there's this whole idea that, oh, but that's what makes it so nice, volunteers and all. But at scale, that's a vulnerability when half of projects have like a one or two maintainers and a giant company's complex database or complex entire stack is leaning on this little tiny project. What if that person gets hit by a bus? What if that person wins the lottery? And what if that person gets sick and doesn't want to work anymore? We've learned about supply chain problems. Literally, we don't have access to certain drugs still because of the boat getting stuck in the canal a year or two ago. So we know how important to not have a single point of failure is. And it just does tie back to this idea that we want to put developers in their happiest place because they're most productive, but we don't want to do it at a risk to everything. We don't want to make them so reliant that that becomes a single point of failure as well, chat GPT or whatever. But considering that the code isn't great, I don't know. I'm really interested. I thought I didn't want to write about AI, but I found areas that I find very interesting because I am, I think we can say I am far more suspicious of it than you are. Oh, maybe. definitely. Well, I, I, I I'm almost led about it as a user. I, I I am very aware of the dangers of using it, even as a user. Like I do not put personal information in. I, I have very deliberately not ticked the box to make it private. I use GPT-4 because I think if I'm benefiting from other people's work, I want my work to contribute to that. But I am very aware of that. But at the same time, some time ago, uh, there was an article somewhere that had found lots of HR Trello boards open because people hadn't made them private. Uh, and this is, again, is this thing that we just trust that whatever appears on our computers without us even digging into it or doing anything or finding out about it is is trustworthy and it's closed mm -hmm. and private. And actually, there is that. But um, yeah, I, I there, well, there's there's. There's lots of things that we need to be thinking about um, with this. I am, I am also <laughs> a bit weary where it can go. Um, okay, good. So that's that's. I mean, we are at the beginning. We are experimenting. Yeah. We and I think that's what what we need to remember as well is that th th this is experimenting. There will be loads and loads of issues. This is not it. These these uh, most of these apps they're still not working how they should. Not just in what we're getting from them, but um, also uh, I, I was. I mean. Chat GPT, GPT four is supposed to be able to access the internet. No way, it does not. I, every time I ask it to summarize an article that's just gone online, no way, it doesn't. It can't do it. And I think I broke I uh, broke Bing Copilot today. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened. It stopped working. So I don't know. <laughs> now we've got it on the record if it makes an international incident. <laughs> oh, no, no I broke Bing. <laughs> so anyway, Jen. Um, uh, your uh, your work as well as in the new stack.io where you where you produce a lot of work uh, where else can people look for some of what you're doing and connect with you lead dev i just also had an article come out about this ai governance policy like how to create one because it's just to me mind boggling that companies are not catching up and communicating basic things like don't put customer information in it. Also, don't put employee information in it. So that just came out. I'm very active on LinkedIn. You'll see where I'm at, including those panels and different recordings. So I'm at LinkedIn with JK Riggins or Jennifer Riggins. You can find me. So I look forward to connecting and continuing the conversation or sometimes argument beating my head against a wall. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. 
Mar, muchas gracias. Ah, oh, de nada. Thank you, Jen. A big thank you for listening to the 21st Century Work Life podcast. We know there are many other shows for you to choose from. Remember to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app, and you can check out the full show notes over at virtualnotdistant.com slash podcasts. Talking of podcasts, we have another show you can listen to, Management Cafe, which you should also be able to find on all podcast apps. I have been Pilar Ortiz. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy.